The topic for uh, today is, is, is a particularly topical one because, as you all know, there is the Copenhagen conference coming up literally in, in, in a few weeks. All of us here uh, have been in various ways involved in that discussion, in that debate, sometimes practically. And so we want to uh, focus not as much on what happens in Copenhagen, but we really want to focus on the issue of renewables, which is one part of that debate. So we actually want to get away from Copenhagen and think about the future of renewable energy. And we ask the question, is the future renewable? And I can't think of three better people than who we have here. What I'm going to ask all three of them to do is to maybe start us off very briefly, maybe in 10 minutes, with some opening thoughts on that question. Is the future renewable? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, will it necessarily be a good thing? Uh, if it is going to be, a, if there is going to be a change, how is that likely to happen? How should it happen? And so questions like that, and then we'll open up uh, for a discussion. Uh, we will, uh, we will uh, start with uh, Professor Muma, who is a professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, a mentor of my own for, for very, very long, and someone that I would look up to in, 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 in many, many fashions. In particular, I would only mention that he is one of the convening lead authors of the forthcoming IPCC report. Uh, on renewable energy. So he has been up to his neck and beyond in that. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And, uh, and this is a, a very timely topic. And as Adel said, I am up to about here with renewable energy at this point. Um, because I've not only been working on that, but I've been working on a, uh, for a side event at Copenhagen on, on the role of renewable energy. And, and I have the latest version of that in my lap here because it has some of the latest figures that we've been able to put together and I wanted to make sure I could share some of those with you. Um, in a sense, the, the, I assume it, it was a double play on words to call it is the future renewable because, uh, because obviously uh, you only get to do the future once in real time and uh, so you don't get to renew it if you've messed it up uh, or at least it takes a very long time to create anything that's, uh, that, that's renewed. Um, but in terms of renewable energy, I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's getting a lot of attention now, and, and for good reason. Um, you know, if you look at the total amount of, of uh, the source of energy in most of the world, of course, it's, you know, it's fossil fuels. That's 80 to 85 percent or something like that. And a big chunk of that is coal, which means that's a huge source of emissions. Um, and renewable energy is uh, much smaller. If you count big hydro, of course, it's a little bit bigger, uh, but we're talking about, about relative, still relatively small amounts, although it looks like last year wind produced maybe 2% of the world's electricity. So um, we had a conference at, uh, at, uh, at Fletcher a year and a half ago, and it was fascinating because we had somebody from the coal industry who kept talking about how much coal was being used to generate, you know, the answer is coal. And Amory Lovins there was, he was looking at the first derivative, which was to say, look what the changes are. And the rates of change of, of the introduction of renewables is astounding. It's still relatively small because we've been doing fossil fuels for 150 years, maybe 200 years, and we've only been doing these renewable energy uh, technologies for maybe 25 outside of large scale hydro. I mean, just to, just to give you a sense of the rate of growth, between 2003 and 2008, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the amount of solar energy increased at an annual rate of 56% a year. That's a lot. Uh, biofuels uh, at about half that rate, 28%. Wind at 25% a year. And hydro about 4% a year. So these were the fast, growing, the fast growing new technologies, obviously, but from a very small base. Still, what it's led to is a situation in which we are seeing more and more um, uh, technology being installed. And it is, it is interesting, I, I was just involved uh, with something called the Solar Decathlon, which is a Department of Energy program where 20 universities out of about 60 who applied were selected to compete in building, designing and building a solar house, which had to be on the mall in Washington, D.C., 20 months after you're told you're in. So Tufts formed a team with Boston Architectural College, which is just down Newbury Street here. We were Team Boston. 
And um, we were one of the 20 competitors. Well, it was amazing to see the innovations in technology. The Germans won again, by the way. They built a house called Surplus House because they, the entire house was just a black box covered with solar panels on all sides. And it produced twice as much energy as it needed to for the competition. And um, they got all kinds of benefits from their government and so on. We struggled with work study students and everybody else. And, you know, so it, it, was, it, was, it was sort of, somebody said it was sort of like Tufts playing Michigan State in the Rose Bowl in, you know, <laughs> football. You know, it was just kind of a different thing. But, but, but uh, to the credit of the Germans, um, their technology was superb. I mean, it was, it was just, just really, really impressive. Uh, every team had some impressive innovation in renewable energy. And um, there the focus is on solar, but also on the other part of the success or failure of renewable energy for a renewable future, which is energy efficiency. Without energy efficiency gains, renewable energy will not make it because You've heard this argument that, well, renewable energy is mostly too dilute to really uh, you know, produce the power densities that we need in different places. But if your power density demands are much lower, then it's easy to do. Um, and so the, 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 these things go hand in hand. Um, there are a lot of scenarios out there. And let me just, just cite a few of them. Um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the German Aerospace Center estimates that uh, by 2030, 40% of the uh, electricity and 40% of the heating uh, uh, in the world could be renewable energy. And that's based on technologies and things that they have. Um, Greenpeace, of course, ups that a little bit to 50%. Um, uh, but um, uh, the International Energy Agency keeps raising their numbers. Every report, the World Energy Outlook that just came out last week, you know, again, the amount of that, that will be renewable energy is, is up a bit more. They're now estimating 37% of electricity, 22% of total ener en energy in 2030 uh, could be renewables. And then, of course, if you saw the cover story of Scientific American in November, uh, Jacobson and DeLucci from Stanford and uh, University of California, Davis, talk about 100% renewables by 2030. And I'm a little skeptical that that could actually be done, but the real value of their article is that they tell you exactly how many wind turbines there would have to be and how many solar panels there would have to be and how many hectares would have to be covered. And it's a really useful article in that regard. And the other point they make, which is often lost, is if we did that, the amount of primary energy that would be required would drop by 31% because of, the, ther of, the, of the, the thermal conversion losses whenever you burn fuels to make mechanical energy or electricity. And, and that's a point that has largely been lost. People say, well, my God, if we have to have 700 exajoules, we're at 500 now uh, per year. If we have to have 700 exajoules by 2030, uh, we can never get that much renewable energy. But the point is, no, you basically would, uh, you need 31% you need, uh, less than 700 if you actually had renewable energy because you wouldn't have to be doing these conversions. It's a very interesting and important argument. So it's not that we need to replace every, every unit of energy we, 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 we use or plan to use with renewable energy because a lot of it will be at a, you can get the same energy service with a smaller amount of renewably generated electricity, for example. Very interesting argument. And if you go to electric vehicles, same sort of thing. 80% of the, of the energy in a gallon of gasoline is wasted. You only get heat from it. You don't get, you only get 20% of that energy going to motion. If it's an electric motor, you get about 80% of the energy out of the electric motor going to motion. So again, you get these savings if you think about a more electrified world with more renewable energy generating it. So those are just some, some, of, the, some of the trends that are, that are happening, which I think are interesting. The other thing is, um, is the question of scalability. Everyone says, well, you could never build enough solar. So we've got to have, uh, in fact, the folks across the street here at MIT or across the river here at MIT talk about we have to have scalability and speed. And the only thing that can do that is nuclear power and coal with carbon capture and storage. Now, I don't know where they've been building, sol uh, building uh, nuclear power plants lately, but speed is not a characteristic <laughs> of nuclear power plant construction as far as I can tell. I mean, it just takes a long time to build nuclear power plants. As the Finns are discovering right now, uh, next door to you, Peter, they, they, um, four years into the project, they're four years behind schedule. 
And this was to be the modular, out of the box, everything including the wallpaper is predetermined and you just, just you know, you take it out of the box and you put it together like a, like a Lego set. It has not worked that way. So the modularity of renewables, however, means you can manufacture individual units, whether those are wind turbines and towers or solar panels in a factory. And when you get up to scale in production, you look at, for example, the amount of power, I mean, think of automobiles. I mean, now, of course, we're only producing 10 instead of 16 million automobiles a year for the United States, but nevertheless, 10 million automobiles a lot. And if you look at the total power of those automobile engines, it is comparable to the total amount of electric generating power in the United States. And we did it in one year with automobiles. Now, it would take some time to scale up to that, but 20 years ought to be able to do that. If you look at the transformation during World War II of automobile plants to making planes and tanks and ships and things, I mean, it was, it was on that scale. We were able to scale up at that rate. And, um, and, 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 and so, you know, I think the future could be renewable, but it's going to take some choices. And, uh, and, we, and, and actually, while I'm, I do, do not wish to suggest we do, should not do any more research and development, we should, but we do not need to do any more research and development to be well up that, up that curve in terms of what we add. We know what to do, we know how to do it, and it's just a question of getting the rules in place, particularly in the United States, which has been literally blocking innovations like this for the last 25 years. So we need to change that. And if we do that, the future will be renewable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You couldn't have given us a better segue to, uh, to, 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 to Michael uh, Caravanes because uh, that really is, is, is his, his forte. Michael Caravanes is a professor at the College of Engineering here at Boston University. But even more importantly for us in this seminar, he comes from a policy background and of really answering that question. It could be done, but what will it take? Uh, to, to really do it if it were to be done. So without any further ado, Michael, I'll... Thank you very I'll much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Bill, for a wonderful exposition here. Uh, I will try to say a few things wearing my hat as a regulator, which is a role that I played for the last uh, five years or so. Um, and um, uh, also as uh, wearing my hat as a systems engineer, uh, which uh, will allow me to say a few things about interactions and synergies and so on that uh, uh, Bill alluded to, but uh, which I think would, could play a much more important role than, than we are accustomed to recognize. Um, so uh, what, is, what is renewable? Is the future renewable? Is the future sustainable? That might be a related question. Is it sustainable in terms of the environment? Uh, we shouldn't kill the environment. We shouldn't uh, violate our sort of aesthetics and our uh, preferences about the environment. Um, is it uh, renewable in terms of uh, energy sources uh, being, re being sustainable, being renewable, being non-depletable? Uh, and uh, is, it, uh, is it renewable in terms of uh, us being able to master enough efficiency to actually do it. Because if we, if we drive ourselves to, um, uh, to a primitive way of living, of course, we can make the future renewable, but we are not about to do that. So I'm going to focus particularly on electricity, which uh, also Bill alluded to as being a very important new way of, of meeting um, energy needs, energy services. And the reason that this is so is that electricity is a much higher quality of energy. You can transform it from one type of, of energy, from kinetic to light to uh, back to kinetic to heat and so on, uh, more efficiently uh, with, uh, in conjunction with, for example, heat pumps in conjunction with uh, low enthalpy um, uh, 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 hydrothermal energy, uh, ge geothermal energy. Uh, can uh, be four times as, as efficient as it is to heat uh, a building with uh, burning directly fuels. So we can conserve fuels uh, by using electricity. Um, it's, um, new technologies are more or less 
congregating around uh, electricity, so electricity generation is what the form of, of new energy and clean energy technologies are taking. And also, electricity allows us a lot of synergies. And these synergies are sometimes an anathema to the romantic approach that the new, the new uh, renewable future is going to be one in which buildings are going to be self-sufficient, buildings are going to be, of course, very efficient, very reliable, and so on. And the truth of the matter is that with, with, the, with the distributed generation of energy and with uh, the, our, our, the, the information revolution and the so technological revolution of, that allows us to install microgrids and understand what's happening in a building, a building indeed will become more self-sufficient. It will indeed become uh, more diverse in the sense of consuming and generating electricity. The building will become more, become more diverse in the sense of, and now the self-sufficiency kind of starts moving into interaction and collaboration. We'll be more able to interact with the rest of the environment. So we want to, to see the new, new generation advanced sustainable buildings or whatever you might want to call them, whose metabolism is such that uh, decreases what they uh, use in terms of, of, of energy uh, whose metabolism is such that they can generate, they can store energy in distributed resources. Uh, they can facilitate the charging of uh, batteries, uh, which might, uh, might drive uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. But at the same time, these buildings, the, the metabolism of this building should be compatible with the, with the metabolism of the built environment, with the rest of a neighborhood, the rest of a city, let me plug in a, uh, a collaborative project, the uh, Ultra X mm -hmm. uh, project that NSF is, is, is supporting, where, uh, where BU is the lead, but uh, Tufts and MIT and Northeastern and UMass are also participating, which intends to study the urban metabolism in the, in the Boston area. Um, so, so we have some transformational changes here that have to be recognized. The transformational change is that the flow of electric energy will stop being always in, in one direction, mm -hmm. from upstream to downstream, maybe from downstream to upstream. For example, in countries where renewable energy has made big strides, in, in uh, Spain, uh, for, for example, uh, last March, was, uh, was, a was a very windy month, and during that month, um, wind parks generated more electricity than coal and, and um, all of the sort of conventional thermal or hydro or nuclear, each one taken separately. Uh, there are some distribution utilities. So distribution utility is the low voltage sort of distribution of, of uh, of electric power that uh, reaches homes and appliances and small businesses and so on. There are some distribution utilities that, that in Spain that are net producers of electricity. So, so there are transformational changes uh, that, um, that we, have to, we have to recognize. And these transformational changes require that this biggest machine that uh, human beings have made, the electric power system, with the high voltage and the medium and low voltage and the consumption and so on, uh, which works in synchrony, is a system that will thrive if its units, if its components, are more flexible, more self-sufficient, but also collaborating. So what can we gain from this collaboration? We can gain an, gain an awful lot. For the future to be renewable, to be sustainable, we need to be able to deal with, with energy sources. We need to be able to deal with infrastructures, the uh, transportation and distribution of electricity, the transportation distribution of water, the, um, uh, the transport, transportation of humans, all of these infrastructures have to be sustainable. How can they be sustainable when today, for example, the, only the distribution portion <coughs> of the generation, transmission and distribution components of this huge system that we call the electric power system, he is responsible for more than 30% of the overall cost. So that's something we never think about. To depreciate those huge um, coal plants and nuclear power plants 
and to pay for their, for their fuel, we spend 60% of the overall cost. And the remaining 40% is maybe 5 to 10% for the high voltage line and 30% for the infrastructure, for the distribution infrastructure that we have down here. So think about it. If we are to have a rooftop PV on, if, uh, if we, have to, we are to have photovoltaics on every rooftop in a residential feeder, uh, when the sun is high at noon, the electricity may flow in the opposite direction. And if it's too much, it may burn the transformers. So we'll have to double the capacity of the transformers. If we have to have an electric automobile in every car, and all in every garage, I'm sorry, in, in that rhymes with the uh, chicken and, uh, with the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and a car in every garage, whatever the American dream. So the, the, our, the modern American's dream might be an electric automobile in every garage. Yeah. So if all those cars come in at 6 o'clock and they plug in, they blow the transformers. So in order to avoid that, if you, if you prima facie, if you look at it um, sort of in isolation, you might say that, okay, we'll, we'll install more transformers will double the capacity of the, but that's 30% of the cost. If we double the capacity of this infrastructure, that portion of the infrastructure that distributes electricity to the homes, uh, that's not really renewable, it's not sustainable, because the, the high cost is going to be a showstopper. And all these technologies that we are ready for uh, <coughs> are, are going to face up with barriers that will delay their adoption. And, and we are impatient. We are all impatient because every kilogram of CO2 that you pump up into the atmosphere stays there for well, 70, half, 100 half, years. Half life What's the half-life? Half-life 100 years. 100 years of a half-life. Yeah. So we are impatient uh, and, and we want to speed up the adoption. Well, it's, it's, fortunately, it's possible with this, with this collaboration to avoid, to make the infrastructure resilient. How? By scheduling the charging of electric automobiles such that we utilize the capacity which is, which is there. So we have a lot of capacity in, the, in, 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 in many infrastructures which is idle a good portion of the time. We use all of it, maybe one hour, one out of the 24 hours or 50, 50 or 100 hours of the 8,760 8, years, 60 hours in a year. But the rest of the time, there's idle capacity. If we can use this idle capacity, how? By collaboration, by being flexible, by recognizing that certain loads, such as is the load, the new load, that I hope we'll have to be confronted with if we get an electric car in every garage. Um, that load is a benevolent load. It's a load that does not require capacity. When you plug in your hairdryer, you require one kilowatt or one and a half kilowatt of capacity right then and there. But when you plug in your electric vehicle with some smarts, with some scheduling, you will require energy. You'll say, I need so much energy on the average, you know, an average capacity or so much total energy between now and 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the morning when I drive off. And then all of, that, all of that demand can be scheduled so as to fill the valleys and make uh, our infrastructure resilient. The same with, with, with wind generation etc cetera, etc cetera. so so you see the interplay between these new technologies the electric automobile could be a facilitator that is going to tear down the barriers to adoption mm -hmm. of uh, renewable energy technology wind uh, wind generation and so on and there are many such examples that i can uh, run across but i will stop here thank you thank you very much michael this is this is wonderful i hope everyone really caught on to because you what you did was something very very interesting which is usually not done on this debate we usually focus on the source you know do we have enough solar do we have enough wind but but what michael is alerting us to is that if you are really going to make the change it's not simply the technologies uh, of generation that we are thinking of you have to think about what that means for the system uh, that by, through which we are going to use it. I've always thought, you know, one of the one of the interesting hurdles is all these uh, gas stations. You know, every corner has an ugly building with steel tanks full of volatile liquids. 
and what will happen to them if we are changing it. But, but your, your, your example of the electric uh, system is a much, much more powerful one. And uh, I'll move along right from there, and I think this is, this is sort of flowing in a very, very interesting way uh, to, to Dr. Miguel uh, Munoz, originally trained as a physicist, has worked on renewable energy, uh, and particularly on, has also been working on renewable energies in developing countries, including in Northern Africa uh, and elsewhere. And he has also been keeping a very close eye on the international uh, policy discussions related to this, both in terms of climate change, but also especially in terms of EU regulation. Uh, so Miguel, all yours. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'll start my presentation with a little anecdote, because I see there's a few students here. And when I was a student, when I began my grad school, and I was an intern in Paris, and I was interested in renewables, and now we're talking year 2000, and I secured an interview with Marianne Hawke at the International Energy Agency at the time, a big week on renewables, and the best advice she gave me, which I still follow and I transfer to you gladly, is renewables is a very good topic. Keep in mind it may remain a niche. So right now renewables are in an explosive grown, growth, as we have seen. It may continue to grow till it's a dominant energy source. It may stop at any point because it's, there's no guarantee that what happened in the past will keep in the future. So I would say I always keep this in mind. Being a pro renewable person, I always think that it may remain a niche. I'm happy now that it's at least a big niche, so it will provide for a living. But that's uh, where I come from. So having said that, I'll, I'll go to address the question of the seminar, which is, is the future renewable? But before that, I cannot say. The main topic, uh, the main point I want you to take home after this and I'll discuss later is that renewable <laughs> energy is not about climate change. And I'll elaborate more about that, but everyone says renewable energy and climate change, and the drivers for renewables are, climate change is one of them, but not the driver. So is the future renewable? We'll start with what is the future? Here we are at the Paris Center for a study of the longer range future. So I'm gonna, instead of talking 2030, I'm gonna talk 2060, 50 years from now, and see what we're thinking about. Is, is it technically possible? Is it feasible that we have a 100% renewable system in 2060? I think the answer is yes, very clearly. We have all these articles coming out. We have the presentation. We have just resources are there. The grid and the distribution system can probably be built up by the time because we're talking about 50 years of time. So it, the, post, the future can be renewable. Now, will it happen? And here there's other questions. For instance, can hunger be eliminated today with today's means and today's resources? Yes. Has it been eliminated? No. So just because we can do it doesn't mean it's going to happen. So the, the answer that I would give is, is the future renewable? I would say possibly, maybe. Maybe possibly. So a, high, a more than half percent, um, than half. It's very Delphic. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet all my money on that. But now I'm going to uh, turn it around and say, let's assume that the future is renewable. So 50 years from now, we have a, a future, that, an energy system that's based on renewable energy. So the question I would have, by then I would be retired, hopefully in emeritus somewhere, and uh, just lay back and see my family enjoy it. I would, the question would be, how did we get there? How did we get 50 years from now to have a renewable energy system? Which brings me to the drivers. What are the drivers now pushing for the transformation of the energy system? And there's three drivers, and I would say in this order, which the first one is energy security, I would argue, and is the countries have a need to secure access to energy supplies. And given the well-discussed and known geostrategic policy, uh, politics and of oil and of all the resources, coal also, and there's a need to secure, countries, uh, to secure energy. Spain, Germany, China now, the leaders on renewable energy are all countries that have acute energy security problems and they have enacted policies to deal with them. So I would say that's the main driver for energy, for renewable energy. The second one is industrial policy. And you have all these countries that betted early on on renewables. Uh, you have uh, Denmark, you have uh, Germany, you have Spain, you have now China. Uh, you have the US which betted in the 80s and then abandoned it just for the technology to be picked up by the Europeans. Uh, that's an industrial policy. Whoever, whoever controls these technologies in the future will control, will have the competitive advantage for the products because they can be able to can manufacture them probably argu arguably at a lower cost. Will be made in China anyway. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And they and they will have the technology that may may power the society in the future if we shift to renewables. So there is a race. There is a race going on to capture those technologies. And the race is hot right now and the US is losing so far, 
but it, it may turn around. Uh, it started in Europe. The Chinese picked on very fast, and now the U.S. is finally getting on. We'll see if they are able to catch up or not. So that race is very hot, and that race is regardless of climate change negotiations. That race is happening. There's a if there, if there is an agreement in Copenhagen or in Mexico or whenever that will facilitate the transition to renewables. But if there isn't, there will be still be a race for renewables. That will happen anyways. So Don, if you're a renewable, you will never hear me make a climate change case for renewables because I think it's counter productive because there's enough good arguments for renewables on their own that li linking it to climate change could be could be could, could have a drawback especially imagine that tomorrow they discover a f that climate change is not that an issue after all that there's an unaccounted for feedback that kicks in at 400 ppms and just cancels climate change it's very unlikely but if that happened and your whole case for renewables is built upon climate change all of a sudden you have no case so Renewables have many merits on their own. There's no need to piggyback them on climate change. What else I would say for a future that's renewable, for an energy system based on renewable energy? So first, what is renewable? And I want to I wanna emphasize that, a uh, few typical misconceptions. The first is one of eff efficiency. So efficiency is a condition, is a precondition, as Bill said very well, for a renewable energy system. But efficiency is not renewable energy. So gains in efficiency are necessary because we need to use less energy density per unit of whatever you're producing. But focusing on energy and efficiency alone and not on renewables misses the point because at, at some point the gains are going to be overtaken by the increasing demand. So re efficiency is a requirement but it's not a renewable. Combined heat and power, another typical one that gets tugged in with renewables. Combined heat and power is not a renewable energy source. It's an, it's an efficient way of utilizing energy, energy, more efficient than we will have today. I say it because in many of the national statistics, they are lumped together. So if you look at the Spanish statistics, for instance, you, have, you can have wind power, solar power generation disaggregated, and then it's pure renewable. But if you look at what they call special regime, which many times they say that's the renewables, actually it has a big component of combined heat and power, which is fossil fuels. So it's, it's efficient use of fossil fuels, but it's not renewable. So whenever anyone is doing papers and stuff, always keep an eye for CHP, combined heat and power, because that's not properly renewable, although it's desirable under the current system. Other things that are not renewables, the greening of fossil fuels. And I'll give you two examples. One is the well-known energy crops, where the actual input, especially in the US, it's either as much or more than the output on energy, if you, once you count the fertilizer and the transport and the life cycle assessment. So I'll give you- in Europe, you think? In Europe, no, Europe the same. I'm just thinking Brazil. I mean, there's a case for Brazil, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, I'll give you another more high-tech example. They've, you've probably heard about algae and biofuels from algae. If you take algae and you put them in the, in the smokestack of a coal power plant, and they take the CO2 from the smokestack and become algae, and then you have biofuel, that's not a renewable energy. That's an increased efficiency of the coal power plant. But on the whole calculation of the thing, you're converting coal into electricity plus the algae that you get on top. So you increase, it's like a combined heat and power. You increase the overall efficiency, but it's not a renewable source. So many, particularly the biomass, but most of the, I would say, I would say, but I'll say many instead of most, many of the biomass schemes are actually greening of fossil fuel systems. They are not a renewable source. So that's another thing to keep in, in mind. Another one that's a bit, a bit uh, controversial is geothermal power. Geothermal, it's clearly renewable. However, we had a summer fellow here, Peter O'Connor. He's a geothermal engineer. <coughs> and he abandoned the field because he said geothermal operations are not sustainable. They drain the heat as if it was a non-renewable source. So basically, they want to exhaust the heat as fast as they can to get as much power and then drain it dry. So it's like a forest. If you cut it down, it's not renewable. If you do it sustainable, it is renewable. So even some of the supposedly renewable sources, depending how you use them, they are non-renewable. So that's also something to keep in mind in the future. In the article that Bill was quoting from the American, from Scientific American, what they describe as real wind, water, and, and sun. I think that's a pretty accurate, but there's other things that will qualify or not. Just, just keep an eye on what is renewable and what's not renewable, because that will, the definition that you use will determine whether the system is renewable or it's not. Other things that would affect the long-term future if we, if we transition to renewable-based energy system. So first, if we, are, if we change our energy system to renewable base, that has the potential to shift the structure of power in society. 
as a, a large. And that has tremendous implications. So that's in geopolitics within, between countries, but mostly within countries. When you, who gives you the power? If you're power independent in your home, if you, have a, if you live in a house like the surplus of the Germans, you're completely independent of the grid. No one can cut your power off. That empowers you, literally. <laughs> too many things. So by the fact that you are not depending on others to provide you your basic needs, you're empowered. And that just that has tremendous implications for the society and for <coughs> the distribution of power. So those are things that are not directly related to the energy system as per energy definition, but that <coughs> as a long range future center, we want to look into those kind of things. How, I don't know, effects on nutrition. I mean, you can have any <clears throat> if you think of the internet and 20 years ago and now how it has changed the face of society, if you change the energy system, it's going to be more profound transformations than the internet brought. And that's enough of an example, I think, to give the scale. I would also say, if you say 100% renewable-based system, I would say, whoever says 100%, I always say, that can be. You know, there, we never have 100%, so it's going to be a it's going to be a based on renewables, but whoever says all, 100% is uh, flax. It, you're, you're always going to have some biomass, you're always going to have your barbecue. There's things that will stay, even if we are on a, on a renewable energy-based system. Another interesting question to me for the future that I would like to know if I could ask now is, will the system be distributed or centralized? And there's this all, most of the renewal advocates today are assume that the system will be distributed because there's so many advantages. So many of the renewables advantages are associated with the distributed system, as you rightly pointed out. But I don't think it's a given. It's a, it's a likely outcome, but we could also have a renewable-based system that's centralized with large power plants, large wind farms, large solar concentrating systems, and the, the distributed remains the exception. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but that's an interesting question. I would like to know the answer once it happens. Other things that I would caution again is if we have a, I still in the 10 minutes. If uh, we have a large scale change to renewable energy or to any large scale thing, we probably will have unintended consequences, unintended impacts like any large systems. So will there be environmental, social, or other unintended consequences of a shift to renewables? I would say most likely. Which will this be? We have no idea because they are, at this point we cannot even estimate. Will it make Will that be a cause not to shift? No. It's just we have tremendous impacts and consequences now. We just have to keep in mind that there will be other difference in the future. I was reading this interesting article saying how wind, massive deployment of wind power would actually change the weather. Because once you start taking enough energy out of the low uh, air layers, they actually in, in affects the local weather. So stuff like that could be happening. Sure, you downgrade hurricanes from five to four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we could have some some of those impacts in the future. And I'll, since Adel is making me signs, I'll cut it there, but I'll just go back that the take home message is that renewables is not climate change. Climate change may be the main driver for renewables if we actually take action on it. If we don't take action on it, will be a, a side benefit of renewables, but we will go on renewables for their own sake. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. I think we have a lot of very interesting issues here. I want to open it up for the audience in a minute, but I wanted to see if any of you, because there are, there are differences, sometimes not so subtle in the vision that you have. <laughs> Of, of what what a future might be. The one thing I, I, I just want to check, but my sense is that we you are all agreed on is that when we think of a renewable future, that doesn't mean all the energy is necessarily renewable, whatever renewable might be. That we are going to live with a mix of different forms of energy as we have for most of human history. Uh, and part of what I take from this panel is that it is not simply what that mix is, but how that mix is distributed. Uh, among society. Uh, but I wanted to see if, if, if any of you have any, any comments on any of the others before I open it up. Bill? Can I go first? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> first of all, I, um, um, I, I mean, I do think that, uh, that, that climate change will be one of the drivers, but it's not the only one. In fact, I, I have this radical notion that we're, one of the reasons we're failing to get a, an agreement for Copenhagen is we're negotiating the wrong treaty because it's a, tr it's a pollution control treaty we're negotiating, and, and that's sort of, that's so, that's so 70s, <laughs> right? right? It, it, it was, that's what we did in the 70s. You cannot put out more than this much pollution. It's all about what you cannot do, and this is a real turnoff. Developing countries say, if you tell me I can't do that, I, I probably will not have energy to, to do my development. Uh, the, US, uh, the US and China say exactly the same thing. You cannot disrupt our economies. Right, you know, it's not about development; it's about our economies, uh, and 
and, and, and then we throw in some language about uh, technical assistance and finance and technology transfers. I think we ought to turn the whole thing around and say what we really need is a development treaty because the problem is development. We are developing using, using 19th century fuels and uh, early and mid 20th century technologies. I mean, you have to remember, Mr. Edison's light bulb was patented in 1875 and we're still using it. The base is the same, the wire has changed, but it's the same device. Now, the new LEDs will be six times as efficient and give the same amount of light. And there's no reason why that number can't get to 10. So we can make a huge difference there. Um, so I think we need a different kind of treaty. I think we need a development treaty that basically says to everyone, everyone in the world, our goal is for everyone in the world to have access to energy services. And those energy services are delivered in a way that does not disrupt the climate or destroy the environment in any significant way. And then we introduce things in that treaty which introduce renewables and efficiency and a whole lot of other things in a way that actually meets the target goals, which is an 80% reduction in 50 years of emissions. I'd like to see the treaty turned around like that because then it's about not only what you can do, but what we will do to make development and energy services available to everyone. That, I think, would change the system dra dra dramatically. Michael? Um, I'd like to um, uh, go a bit further uh, along the lines that you, that you laid there and uh, say that sustainable progress uh, will only be made if it's based on efficiency, on economic viability and so on. And I'm a European too and I share your point of view that we Europeans are better than you Americans. However, if, we look at, if you look at what we Europeans have, have achieved, there are, there are some big question marks as to what we have achieved. We have agreed and signed certain targets that we have not delivered. Yeah. Yeah. We really have not delivered. Whereas if you, see, uh, if you see progress in the United States in terms of in various states and, and overall, the, the improvement or the decrease in, in, in CO2 emissions and so on is quite laudable. And, and recently, uh, when, the, when the renewables have become closer to market and more competitive and so on, you see a, a, a big takeoff. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Europe, where the renewables were essentially subsidized, mm -hmm. that we have to be very thankful for because they've, they've, uh, they've brought about um, uh, improvements in, in technology <coughs> and really decreased the, the cost of supply of, of, of photovoltaics and so on, whose cost declines at 10% per year. It's incredible. Photovoltaics was out of sight, but it's going to be particularly um, <coughs> at the distribution level where the, where the cost is twice the cost or the benefit at the, at the centralized level, uh, photovoltaics uh, are going to be probably competitive in three, four years. Mm -hmm. really competitive. So, so I think we have, to, we have to look at what is sustainable in terms of economics and so on. I wouldn't be so much sort of concerned about is it renewable, although I think this is why you, how you meant it. Mm. To, to, to do good to your, um, to your prophecy that renewables are not going to be 100%. Or. So, so I don't care if something's 100% renewable. Solar energy is not renewable, right? The, the sun is using up its <laughs> yeah. helium. So, so if we take it to extremes, nothing is renewable, really. So we should, we should, we should look at what works, what is sustainable, and, uh, and go forward this way. And, and also the... the uh, the political implications uh, are, are extremely important. It's very difficult in the United States, in Europe, to uh, do away with those interests that align themselves with coal generation and so on. They're not going to lie down and, and uh, shut their... But, but here, here are some ways to go forward. If we, if we go forward with the electrification of the transportation industry, all of a sudden, that stops, that gets us away from the quagmire of very slow growth in demand. And then we can make sure that this additional demand is met renewables. by renewables, by clean energy generation. In 15, 20 <laughs> years, you have, you, you reduce 30% of CO2 emissions, which come from, uh, from the internal combustion engine. You build uh, a new industry of renewables, which can then face up with the conventional generation. 
So from, from a geopolitical and strategic uh, point of view, I think, you know, sort of directions like this would be, would be, could be uh, more successful than, than just chugging along and, and subsidizing feed-in rates and so on. Miguel, very, very briefly. Sure. Because I just want wanted to, to stress what Michael said and about the, the importance of the distribution system. And just give you an example. In Spain now, last year, 11% of the electricity was generated with wind power alone. And last, uh, last week, we had a record of 50% over six hours of the generation was wind power alone. It's been acknowledged in, by the grid the system operator in Spain that this could never be accomplished in the US with the grid you have right now. So the, the structure of the grid and the capacity of the grid in the US would not be able to accommodate even a small growth, like I mean, a 10% of the generation like in Spain under the current circumstances. So it's, it's crucial to improve the distribution systems of the, in order to be able to deliver the energy, even if you have it. And then on the photovoltaics, I just want to show this little toy. This is a lamp, uh, solar photovoltaics with a LED. Gives a little more light than the flashlight, just enough to read. Cost twenty dollars at IKEA. For everyone you buy, they give one at un to UNICEF for uh, giving away somewhere it's needed. Uh, mm -hmm. This it's in IKEA. That means that they are probably selling a lot of them, even if it's a, as a yes. toy. And so it's coming. It's coming and it's here. And Julius, who is a postdoc here at uh, the center, will say that he's interested in doing an economic analysis of whether this is feasible in Kenya, for instance, for commercial distribution of renting on, by, on a day basis uh, on the villages. So that's, that's what we're talking about, about mainstreaming. So I, I want to open it up. It's obviously coming. And what we're really interested also in is what is the shape of what is coming? The one thing since you Europeans and you Americans <laughs> have had your say. There's the rest of us yes. in the developing world, but I want to raise this issue. A lot of whom have been using what may or may not be renewable in Miguel's thing, but it's certainly alternative energy, and it's not pretty living on that energy. There are lots, there are millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people who live on twigs and, and biomass and all sorts of things, and, and that's not the future they want. That's right. They actually want this future. Yeah. They probably don't also want that future, and frankly, I'm with them. I understand exactly where they're coming from. So if you're thinking of a renewable future for the world, what does it mean uh, for not the third world, but the two-third world uh, that is not Europe and America? So I wanted to throw that out. I don't have an answer, but I think that's one of the questions that we should be thinking of as we add to your questions. One, two, yes. Uh, yeah, do use the mic. It won't do anything to the sound, but you will be recorded in, for posterity in the video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my question, I guess, uh, um, well, uh, comes off of what uh, Dr. Karamanis was saying about um, sort of the transformation of the grid and how it'll have to be collaborative, flexible, and resilient. And um, I guess uh, where I come from in California, our electricity provider is none of those things. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, we've been fighting them for a while now about... Uh, net metering laws, specifically with photovoltaic systems on uh, residential and commercial systems. Um, I, you spoke briefly about this, about how to do away with interests that sort of have a, um, you know, investment in the current structure. And so I guess would you say, do we collaborate with these people and try and convince them that there is a, a market for running a distribution system as opposed to sort of providing or do we kind of have to sort of bludgeon them into submission? Mm. <laughs> okay. let's, let's take a Fair, couple that's of... That's an excellent question. Yeah, let's take a couple of questions and I'll give then the floor to the speakers because we have a number of people. Anne? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you probably have seen Gore's new book, mm -hmm. Our Choice. Uh, it's got a lot of wonderful photos in it, <coughs> so it's very easy reading. I, I totally enjoyed it. There's a picture here of Europe and it's planned supergrid with Northern Africa, in which Northern Africa would provide solar power and Northern Europe would provide wind power. So my question for you is, and it's just at this point, I think, just an idea, right? So my question for you is, what are the policy challenges that we need to get past for this to work? Because we're talking about selling stuff between countries, right? And then what are the technical challenges for the supergrid yeah. to work? So. Not only technical, but regulatory and yeah. policy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's take one more, Pablo. Thank you. Uh, Bill, following up on your comment, climate change, our discussions should be about discussions about development. The figures you mentioned are global, I assume. Do you have any either figures or information or insights about what's going on 
in those places that most need development, rural Ethiopia, shanty towns in mm -hmm. Sao Paulo, etc. Mm -hmm. How is the profile of changing energy sources looking like and what may happen? Uh, I, I was uh, with the humanitarian sector working in, in rural Ethiopia and we had this project where we want to support adaptation to climate change, cattle is dying, cows are no longer sustainable, chickens are a more effective, efficient way to convert uh, grain into protein, there aren't enough eggs, so they bought a German uh, incubator. Awesome technology, big box, you plug it, after 30 days the eggs stay warm enough and you have chicks. Well, guess what? The electricity is not reliable in Ethiopia. We went to pick up the eggs to distribute at the village. The eggs were had not hatched. So there's the idea of going solar, but just converting solar light into a, a warm enough box without electricity there. All these ideas that are development solutions for the people who don't even know what electricity is. What is going on, both in the change, climate change debate and beyond that, for making more use of renewable sources there? Good question. Okay. Let me, uh, before we lose sight of the questions up here, mm -hmm. uh, come back to the panel and anyone. Michael, you want to start? We had a number of oh, points. Oh, we can say something about the grid. I can relate to you a personal experience that I had with the appearance and development of um, uh, markets, uh, power markets at the wholesale level. So that happened uh, first in Chile, but Chile is too small of a country to count. Then it happened in, in 89, 90 in, um, in England when they unbundled the, the natural monopoly, which is the transmission uh, network and generation, and they forced uh, divestiture and so on and so forth. And then, of course, uh, from um, uh, the mid-90s until, he until now, we have 60-70% uh, of consumers in the United States living in areas that are supplied by competitive um, wholesale power markets, which have imposed a different operation and a different planning on, on the, uh, at, the, at the transmission level grid. And, and the utilities fought uh, tooth and nail at that time. They thought that the ideas were crazy, that this would never happen, but it did happen. Well, guess what? We are about to have the second revolution where markets or the ability to charge on the basis of real costs as opposed to net metering and so on, which you don't like and rightly so you don't like. Uh, so retail markets are about to appear. And for retail markets to appear, of course, we have to invest in our grid but we have to invest in our grid in a manner that's not going to be extremely onerous. We have to invest on the cyber component of the, of the, of the grid. Uh, and if we do that, that is going to, to mitigate, to ease the investment in the, in the hardware uh, part of the, of the grid, which is much more expensive. So we definitely have to, to renew our grid. There's, there's uh, Pacific Gas and Electric that is complaining bitterly in uh, hearing that uh, in a call for comments that the that FERC invited, if we are to go into policy on the smart FERC grid, is the, said, federal the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So it's the regulator who is not looking conservatively at state interests, but is looking at, at all of the interests. And, and FERC, this federal uh, regulator, uh, promoted uh, very much the competitive wholesale markets and hopefully they will promote retail markets, although it's harder because retail markets are by definition within states. Anyway, we'll see how this will happen. But Pacific Gas and Electric is complaining that as of a few months ago, uh, when, the, when those comments were, were uh, invited, uh, 15,000 households are paying zero for the electricity they consume. And they say, gee, you know, these guys generate electricity from uh, photovoltaics, but sometimes they generate more, so they use our grid, they use the distribution network. Sometimes they consume more, they use the distribution network. So they use it one direction or the other, and they pay nothing. Are they right? Well, let's, let's see at the, at the current rates. The current rate structures, which are providing absolutely no incentive to improve the management of, of consumption. They, the, current, the current regulatory regime is that there's cost plus 
uh, compensation um, for the distribution companies. So NSTAR, National Grid here, they have the, the distribution lines and they have to maintain them and so on, they have to depreciate them. And they're very happy to collect four or five cents per kilowatt hour that you consume, just for making it possible to come to, to your home. They don't care whether you consume at, um, at noon when the marginal losses are 20% or whether you consume at a time where the marginal losses, line losses, uh, power losses are 5% or 2 or 3% at night. Okay, so there's absolutely no incentive. If the retail market is, is instituted, then we'll definitely have incentives to, to, uh, to build our grid, of course, which, which will give us the information and so on, and to do the right thing. In Europe, this was, uh, this was uh, approached in different ways. For example, in Italy, by law, um, all the distribution companies, the major one being Enel, which was broken up in terms of its uh, holdings in, in, in uh, generation, but still maintains 90% of the distribution uh, market, uh, were, they, they were all forced to change their meters to electronic meters with telemetering, uh, and, and they did it. So they, they have now 39 million in Italy, um, electronic, remotely controlled uh, meters. So, of course, policy and regulation has to work hand in hand with a with changing environment, and, um, and things will go forward. But I agree with you that net metering is not a good idea. And I agree with, with you that uh, our grid in the United States needs a lot of, a lot of changing, but we can, we can do very nicely by investing on the cyber component very carefully, rather than sort of blindly doubling the, the dumb distribution networks, that cap the capacity of the dumb distribution networks that we have right now. Bill, any of the other questions, especially the super grid? Is that the uh, policy uh, challenges to that or this? Since yeah. you pay zero, I, I, should, yeah. I, I, I should say, Bill lives in the super house that he has built for himself that generates energy. So you're one of those people that Michael was talking about that right. pays zero for use of the grid. Yeah, yeah. Probably you get paid, but they jeep you because they pay you the whole thing. Yeah, this, uh, you know, <laughs> they charge me 18 cents a kilowatt hour, including transmission distribution, which is roughly half of that. Right. And, uh, but when I sell to them, I get paid three and a half cents. Right. Because, the because the price of natural gas was so low. So, you know, sometimes I, I, I generate a lot, but I only get to pay, you know, I get $11 credit or something like right. that. Uh, but on this bit, just one comment on this. Um, uh, they did not have to build an additional piece of transmission right. or distribution system to serve me or for me to serve them. Right? In other words, basically, I, c I just use the wires that are there and so it didn't cost anybody anything extra. But you my probably marginal delay. Cost, I delay you, you by delay some, expansion. Exactly, exactly. So anyway, price. that's just a question on the grid. And just one other thing you'd mentioned earlier is will it be centralized or distributed? I think it's going to be a hybrid. And it's going to be super grid, uh, centralized, and distributed. And that, I call that the hybrid grid. I don't I know agree. if that's the right term or not. But, but anyway, uh, that's, going to be, uh, that's going to require far more intelligence in the grid than we are accustomed to. And I think it'll be all of the above. Uh, and there are real advantages. I mean, where we can do it on buildings, let's do it on buildings and use that energy internally. No losses, line losses from up there to down here to speak of. Uh, you know, it's really, there are real advantages. Um, on the super grid, um, uh, actually there's a, a consortium of 12 German companies that have incorporated to do the Desert Tech project that you described. Um, they claim they will have the first uh, piece of it done in five years. I'm skeptical of that, but I'm, I'm generally skeptical about accelerated uh, uh, time frames. Um, and <clears throat> when, when, when this was presented at our IPCC meeting uh, in the integration chapter, um, I looked at the figure they put up, which is like the one you just showed, and I was absolutely stunned. What do you notice about that? Because it comes back to Pedro's question. There is not one line that goes from these large-scale concentrating solar power stations in the Sahara Desert that go to any African country. It all goes across the Mediterranean to Europe. Now, you know, they're also building a, a, a natural gas pipeline to stop flaring natural gas in Nigeria. 
Do you think any of that natural gas is going to any country in Africa? No, it all goes to Europe. So it's the same model of, of any country that has resources, exports all of it and gets no benefit from it within its own country. It's that, it's that same exploitive model. And I think that's not good. I mean, if they're gonna do the super grid, and they're just huge international issues and the vulnerability of a super grid when you think about a world of instability, political instability and people who don't like other people and would like to disrupt them. It, boy, disrupting a super grid would sure be a lot of fun if you're one of those people, right? So anyway, I think there are a whole bunch of issues around the super grid. And if I could just address uh, Pedro's question about the poorest, I think that's, re that's really critical. Um, let me just give you, I mean, I mean, you know probably better than I because you're in the field with this, but um, one of the problems, of course, in developing countries is, is uh, safe water supply. And, uh, and so people are told to boil their water. Well, the amount of firewood it takes to boil enough water to have safe drinking water is a very large amount, and, and, and we're running out of firewood in certain places just because, not, not just because we're boiling water, but just all the uses for, for, of that fuel wood. Um, Someone of you know Ashok Gadgil out at uh, at, uh, um, Lauren, uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs uh, came up with an interesting device which they've been uh, now using. It, co it costs only a couple of hundred dollars and it provides safe water for an entire village and it's solar energy based. Basically, it's a it's a big galvanized tank on top of which is a solar panel and inside of which is an ultraviolet lamp. And if you s fill this with water in the morning. By the evening, the water in there, it's killed all the germs and children don't die of diarrheal disease and so on. And it uses something like one two hundredth the energy of fuel wood and it saves all that firewood for some other purpose. That's, that's an example of how renewable energy can make a huge difference in the poorest countries. And I think the other example you're, you're talking about is, is a thermal, uh, solar thermal energy is really easy to capture and it's really cheap to make. And so if you have some, some process or some, something that is needed, whether it's uh, your incubator for chickens or to dry grain or all these kinds of things, there are really very simple technologies that can be done. And finally, if you go up a step and you want to start doing these kinds of things, I mean, in India, uh, you know, Tata is, uh, 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 Terry, the Tata Energy Research Institute is making available these integrated solar uh, lamps, uh, which basically, you know, you put them out in the sun in the daytime and then at night you can hang them in your place and you have, you have lights. And that turns out to be a whole lot cheaper than solar panels and, and wires and grids and all these converters and inverters and all these kinds of things. And, and as we get smarter about it, I think we'll find more, I mean, there could be a, a, there could be a sewing machine for a woman in a village that has has a solar panel attached to it. So it's an electric sewing machine instead of a treadle one and her productivity goes up a factor of four or five. Or the carpenter with his tools whose productivity goes up by a factor of 10 with just a very small amount of solar something tied to some very basic electrical tools. Refrigerator for milk. Yeah, Rich. On any of these? Yeah, and the super grid also. This, I think it's my, uh, this, this idea has been around forever, since the 70s, I think. Yep. At the time, it was using the gas from flare, flaring and putting the power plants in, on origin. And then, so it's, this is one of these engineering ideas that never dies. And it keeps <laughs> on coming back. And now it's with so solar energy. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen because of all the hurdles. It's just too vulnerable. And the, the geopolitical implications are too high. And engineering is a, quite an engineering feature. But uh, just keep in the context, keep in the context that it's been there forever and it's, uh, it never has happened because it's always happening. And then uh, an answer to your question and the people that actually today lives in renewables and they don't want to live like that. I think the key here is that the advocates call modern energy access as services. So you're talking about modern energy services provided with renewable, not primitive energy services yes. provided with renewable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the big development question is, is, is really whether it's sort of cute farm level things only that we are doing or whether there's a transformational change and, and maybe I'll throw the question but but let others also add questions to this. Do you see, uh, and any <coughs> of you can take this, do you see uh, energy technology leapfrogging happening in the developing world like for example we've seen with cell phones mm -hmm. that could, are, are there things on the horizon that might allow some developing countries to leapfrog but let me let me see if there are any other questions. We do want to end by two. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if you can keep the questions and the responses short. So this relates to what you're saying, it, it, the little cue. I mean, some of the examples you gave were very small scale. So if the USGS, when they recently you know, measured you know, oil reserves around the world, if res with reserve growth and everything else, if there still is so much fossil fuels left, will an energy transition ever mm -hmm. truly occur on a large scale? Because it seems the incentive really would be to maintain the status quo. So. I'm just wondering, without maybe something being tied to climate change um, or the argument revolving mm -hmm. around it, what else would be the driver of an energy transition, which, I mean, MIT said it was going to be something like 30 years before we could ever switch our infrastructure over to these renewable energies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let me take just another, by, by the way, MIT never says anything, just like BU never says anything. Someone at MIT, <laughs> I'm sure, said someone that, but <laughs> let's not co-opt the whole thing. Well, yes. <laughs> MIT just sits there, you know, it's, yeah. right. <laughs> people there say a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, there was a lot of talk about reducing the general demand for energy efficiency as a big part of making renewable energy um, effective and a possibility. What do you see as the best way to reduce energy efficiency, or energy demands in the near future, whether it be building code adjustments or other technologies and integration systems? Okay. One more maybe, and then we'll give a last round to our speakers. Okay, why don't we start then? Uh, just on, in terms of the, the, that last question, uh, having, having just built this uh, super efficient house, which by the way, has been tested and certified as uh, having a so-called HERS rating of 14, which means that the house is, uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, would use 14% of the energy of a code-built house. Yeah. So I've already gone my 80% to meet the climate goal, if you like, and I could burn propane and I would be doing just fine. <laughs> but we, we, we gilded the lily and we put solar panels on and it's designed to be zero net energy and totally zero emissions. So it's possible to do it. And, 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 uh, and, and what I learned in that was how poorly American houses are built. I mean, this, was, this required a contractor who was actually willing to take the time and learn from the engineer and the architect what needed to be done. And he was magnificent and his workers were magnificent. But, you know, most houses are really thrown up. And, we don't even, you know, it's estimated that probably less than half of houses that are built meet the code, which is pretty pathetic in Massachusetts, which has one of the highest building codes in the country. <laughs> All right. So, so, so that we do need higher building codes and we need people trained to, you know, supervise that and oversee it and, and, uh, and, and, and not, not so much with the stick, but with the carrot to, to help the builders do better. And, and we have almost no capacity, we, we have not set up anything in this country to do that. Europe, again, I have to admit, much better. You know, in Germany, if you go and rent a place, you get an energy sticker for that place. Whether, you're, if it, whether it's an apartment or a house. And every time you sell a house or an apartment or a condo, you, get, you, get the, uh, you have to have, uh, have the energy certified. That, that goes a long way towards moving it from the marketplace <coughs> demand side as well. Right. So I think that's, I think that's, so you, we have to have both these, if you like, softer ways as well as harder engineering ways of, of making, making uh, all, of this, uh, all of this happen. Energy is much, more, is, is much more costly in Europe. Yes. So this is why uh, the average uh, car burns a lot less gasoline because mm -hmm. amongst others, not, not only the, it's not only due to the to the uh, sort of green uh, conscience of the Europeans, but it's because the cost has been high. But um, in, addition to, in addition to improving technology in the code, which is extremely important, and it's a low-hanging fruit that we, can, that we, have, to, we have to take yep. advantage of, uh, the way we use these buildings is very important because, for example, there's overwhelming evidence that uh, the energy consumption, the low energy consumption that an engineering study predicts Mm -hmm. is not really met if, if the inhabitant is not Bill, but somebody else who doesn't care and leaves the, window, the windows open and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's the behavior. And then it's, it's going beyond changing the metabolism of the individual buildings to having the individual buildings interact with the rest of the, with the rest mm -hmm. of the, of the, of the, because if you, if you use, if you, if you shift your use of, electri of electricity, 
then you may actually conserve at the higher level because during, during peak hours we generate electricity from the, from the most expensive, least efficient, efficient. generators. Mm -hmm. So if you shift uh, your, your consumption to other times, you actually improve the overall system's consumption of electricity. Yeah. So it's the collaboration and the interaction in addition to, to improving it, things uh, locally. Uh, just to highlight that point, because I think Michael is exactly right. We've, we've, talked, we've talked about technology shifts and the importance of that. We've talked about regulatory and policy <laughs> shifts and the geopolitical implications. At the end, a lot of it is about the behavioral shift. Mm -hmm. Not simply that, you know, I will start behaving better, but once I start behaving in a way that I demand a certain type of service in a certain type of building and a certain type of system, the system starts responding to that. So there is a lot of this shift, if it's going to happen, is really going to come from there. And that might actually have been the biggest change of the last 10 years, more than the technological one. This, the, the discourse has changed. But uh, Miguel, quickly. So I want to answer on the question of the driver for transition. Uh, the first one will be scarcity. And by scarcity, as you said, there's enough of the stuff in the ground to last for a long time if you don't count for climate change. But for instance, you look at the old price swings of the two years ago, which are going to come back anytime soon. That's part of the scarcity thing. It's uh, just when you have those volatility in prices, that knocks you off your economy, like economic actors and stuff. So when you're talking about scarcity, you're not only talking about the physical scarcity, but the economic scarcity and stuff. So that's one of the drivers that will shift, that will make the shift. And the other one is the economic competitiveness. The moment it's more efficient to produce things with renewables on a country on a whatever scale, and that, that country can sell their products cheaper, that's it. That's the end of whatever component of the system. It's not going to happen all at once. It's going to happen component by component. So that's the end of whatever component of the fossil fuel system is based that gets all, all efficient by renewable. So those would be the, the drivers that I said at the beginning, energy security and industrial policy. Yeah. As, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask one quick fire question to each one of you for a very short <coughs> question, short answer. But before I do that, Michael, could I actually ask you uh, to introduce uh, two folks, CC and its work, just in a few sentences. There's a very exciting uh, initiative here at Boston University, uh, multiple colleges, multiple departments working on energy and environment. Uh, CC is one of the uh, co-sponsors of this seminar, and I thought since we have people here from various places, if you could just say a b word about what's happening there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm preaching to the choir here, but so much <laughs> better. The Energy and Environmental Sustainability Initiative is an initiative that uh, was started university-wide at the prompting of, uh, of uh, Brown, a uh, new president, and which is uh, trying to develop a uh, community across colleges and schools at Boston University uh, of uh, scholars that um, uh, are interested in energy. And uh, so engineering and CAS and the School of Management are participating in, 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 this, in this effort. And uh, one of the first uh, things that we did uh, on, the, on the educational side of things is to introduce courses that uh, are going to introduce to non-engineers, for example, energy physics and uh, electric power markets. And courses that are going to introduce to non-economists uh, uh, world oil markets and uh, climate science and, and, and so on and courses in the School of Management that are going to introduce risk management and new business models, new contract design and so on that uh, is, is, is important. Because we believe that you certainly need to have depth in a particular area, in energy technology, in finance, in what have you, in markets, um, competitive markets if you're an economist, etc. But unless you understand the technical, the economic, the uh, management issues and the climate issues, uh, you will not be able to do a good job in it. So that's, that's CC. And in addition to the, to the education program, of course, we have, uh, we have research programs in disciplinary teams that, uh, that are, are getting together uh, and in, in promoting. Even though all of you, many of you know of this already, we wanted to highlight this again because we want you to be ambassadors and let, let the rest of the campus know. But I do think this is one of those shifts much like NSF having that competition, Tufts entering that competition, which has changed things. I mean, I think the conversation has changed. Yeah. On that note, very quickly, yes, no, and I'll start the with... President I'll, of the Energy Club. I'll, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll start with Miguel, and, and, and we'll end with this question. 50 years from now, that was your framework. 
do you see the the world being renewable in terms of energy? Not 100% or anything? Yes. What, so, so 50 years from now, we are no longer talking about this question. I say yes. Okay. Michael, what's your sense? If you look 50 years, do you have the city that you are describing where buildings talk to each other, where the, 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 the system, positive, negative? I would think so, but, but it will look very different. And the balance of centralized and distributed, and the balance of distributed and integrated versus standalone will be very important. For example, you know, I wanted to put a plug in to this uh, uh, PV, to the yeah. PV areas. If I have PV on my, on my rooftop, in order to inject it into the grid and support my neighbors, I need to go through some costs. I need to condition the electricity to make it alternating current and so lose 10, 15% mm. in, in that conversion. During certain times, it may be beneficial to supply directly my direct current yeah. appliances, yep. computers and so on and so forth. So, so the, the Westinghouse uh, Edison duel in the beginning of the century mm -hmm. may kind of uh, find a new, uh, a new equilibrium, a new balance in which we use. So certain, certain times it may be beneficial to, uh, to have distributed generation not be integrated and certain other times to be integrated. So self-sufficient and interaction is going to be very important and is going to characterize this brave new world that uh, we'll have in 50 years. In the brave new world, Bill, 50 years from now, are we still wondering what will come out of Copenhagen? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we may still be, still be negotiating it. Copenhagen is still there, aren't Yeah, they? right. Let's hope it's still there. Isn't there water uh, levels? Yeah, just, just sort of, uh, let me put it in the context of a response to your question. Uh, when, when Sheikh Amani was the head of OPEC, he made a famous statement when they tried to raise the price of oil too high. And he said, just remember, the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. It was because something better came along. Right. And if renewable energy proves to be better than fossil fuels, there's no question that it will clearly be what replaces our current expectations 50 years from now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you also for that positive note. We usually ask a question like this at the end of the seminars. On most subjects, we get rather depressing answers. <laughs> so it's good to see a bunch of people from the energy world giving us a positive answer. Positive Thank you very much. Very we good. have a little black box for our guests from oh the outside. Oh, there. oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank, oh. you. Uh, thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming here. Oh, very good.